So I'm Debbie Corrigan and I'm the Deputy Dean, actually Acting Dean at the moment. And I welcome you on this very cold evening to our second last Dean's Lecture for this year, but they will be back next year, so um, keep, keep your eyes out. So it is actually my absolute pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Graham Parr this evening, who's going to give the Dean's Lecture. I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about, um, about uh, Graham. So I asked Graham how long he'd uh, been at Monash because I've been here forever. So I always forget how long other people have been here. So Graham's been here for 13 years. And I remember when Graham arrived because it struck me that Graham was somebody who was up for a challenge. And I say that because when Graham arrived, he had John Loughran as his PhD supervisor, he had, who's now the dean. He had me as his mentor, I'm now the deputy dean. And his other mentor was Gail Hildebrand, who at that time was the associate dean education. So I'm thinking, taking three leaders in the faculty on as people who are mentors for you as you begin your career, all of course giving contradictory advice as <laughs> academics always do, um, meant that I thought Graham was very much up for a challenge. And I think he's certainly done that. And I'm really looking forward to his talk tonight because one of the things about Graham is that he has always grounded his research in teacher practice. His PhD was converted to a book that was about speaking back to standards-based reforms, very much located with the teacher voice. And tonight, I think we're going to hear more stories about teaching and teacher education and speaking back to standards-based reforms. So Graham, looking forward to it. Congratulations, well done. Thank you very much, Deb. Before I go further, I'd like to say that Monash University's Australian campuses are proudly on Coolan land in Melbourne and I would acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Uh, so yes, thank you to Deb for those kind words um, and thanks to everyone for braving the wintry weather at Melbourne that we've been hit by. Um, it's great to see colleagues, uh, teachers, graduates, research students uh, all here um, as part of a, a conversation that we're having, at least um, an implied conversation, even though I'm going to do most of the speaking. Uh, many of you have an abiding interest in narrative-based research practices. Uh, the signs of practices that I'm going to talk about tonight that do speak powerfully back to standards-based education reforms. Uh, in different ways, all of you here are part of what I think is important educational work and research that needs to speak back to uh, standards-based reforms and, and I thank you for being part of the conversation tonight. Now I promised in the abstract for this event that my lecture would be in the form of a narrative. And in fact many of the stories I will tell and retell are about English teaching and English teacher education because I suppose that's what I know best. But the central arguments have relevance to all of us concerned with school education, teacher education and educational research. I'll be using a variety of narrative strategies to develop the story of the lecture overall and to present a number of smaller stories within it. At times in the lecture, I'll call upon some voices in Melbourne's English education community to help me tell or retell some of those stories. So in advance, I'd like to thank um, Natalie Bellis, Sarah Shaw and Helen Woodford for your contributions to the lecture. Okay, now I want to begin by explaining the way I use the term speaking back in my 2010 book that Deb was uh, flashing before your eyes and again in this lecture tonight. Because in some respects the policy landscape has changed significantly since my PhD and, and that book um, published in 2010. And yet many of the worrying trends that I and others were identifying at the time of that book have stuck around and become more disturbing. Disturbing for teachers in schools, disturbing for teachers out of schools, disturbing for teacher education sector, and ultimately disturbing for children in schools and various other educational institutions. Now, I argued in my book in 2010 that we had an ethical responsibility as educators to speak back to some of these disturbing developments in policy. I'll be arguing here tonight that 
in 2016, it's never been more important for us to critically, creatively and collaboratively speak back to the kinds of ideologies behind standards-based reforms and respond to some of these disturbing developments in a variety of ways. But it won't be all bleak, and so I'll be showing that there's also some pretty good news out there that's worth sharing. Okay, so let me just start with this notion of speaking back. And wh what do I mean by speaking back? Well, let me represent some of the things that it might be. I suppose it could be a bit of this. It could be a bit of that. <laughs> it could be a little bit of the kind of the modern day um, David and Goliath and, um, and those of us who are trying to speak back to standards-based reforms are constantly being, being um, uh, sprayed with uh, cassicum spray and rendered neutral or, or unable to, to do much. Or maybe I'm talking about kind of giving <laughs> teachers uh, the, the, the space and the encouragement to utilise their voice to be able to speak back to a variety of ways that, um, that their work is being compromised. Well, maybe it's a number of all those things, but actually there are two words which are underpinning what I'm talking about tonight which can't be represented by a couple of cute memes. So they are advocacy and praxis. And I want to spend the next few minutes talking about the kinds of understandings of advocacy and practice that I think are really important in the kind of work that's happening in 2016 in education spaces uh, in Australia and across the world. So that's a, a brief uh, introduction. Um, this is the kind of uh, areas that I'd like to cover. We'll start with a, a bigger picture narrative, a fairly quick bigger picture nat narrative, and then we'll have what I've called a story of meaning making in a school space that will feature some of Natalie Bellis's work. Then I'll tell a different kind of story about standards-based education reforms between 2008 to 2016, which has rendered the most remarkable, extraordinarily comprehensive saturation of education spaces by standards and standardising um, movements of one sort or another. I want to talk about the role of narrative in praxis as a way to speak back to standards-based reforms. I want to spend a little bit of time, I know this is not the space to talk theory for too long, but uh, I want to be able to uh, assure people that the kind of work that people are doing in this space is not kind of romanticising narrative, that narrative is the solution to all of our problems. If we could just tell stories to each other, then the world would be a better place. But this is actually pretty well theorised work, um, and, and I want to finish the, the lecture by introducing you to some, of, some more of those uh, narrative-based praxis projects that are happening within professional learning communities uh, in Melbourne and in Australia and other parts of the world as well, including um, professional learning communities in English methods at Monash in the education faculty. Okay, now, when my book came out in 2010, and that was f certainly s close on the heels of my, my work with Brenton Dakey and Sue North and a range of Monash colleagues, on the National Mapping of Teacher Professional Learning Project it was a huge, huge project that had um, five or 6,000 participants answering questions of one sort or another. We had um, 80 hours of, um, of stories being told by stakeholders in professional learning across Australia. And there were some pretty powerful messages that were coming through. And I'm going to compare that with um, about 10 years on in a, in a moment. So there was a strong consensus that teacher professional learning, including pre-service teacher learning, was crucial in improving student learning and out outcomes and well-being. There was, however, little consensus about the way that professional learning should be supported or, or the kind of accountability measures that people could say, well, I want bang for my buck, I want to know if, students, uh, if teachers in my school or in my space are engaging in professional learning, how they are accountable. Standards-based reforms were already by that stage significantly mediating practices of one sort or another. There were already quite concerning um, instances where professional learning was being standardised across jurisdictions or states so that a one-size-fits-all notion of professional learning was operating. And there were strong imperatives that that professional learning was constructed so that there was evidence of a particular kind being generated so we could trust it, so we could show that it was good stuff. However, at the same time, there was always a also a strong trend for teacher, uh, teachers to be engaged in sustained, collaborative action research or practitioner inquiry projects. So now fast forward 10 years. 
A few things, as I said before, have changed and others uh, have got significantly worse. Standards-based reforms are now saturating practices and systems and educational identities. The focus on is now more on higher quality teaching by individuals to improve student learning and well-being and there's interestingly less focus on teacher professional learning, partly because it's so difficult to be able to measure it. And as we're seeing, uh, there'll be, you will hear some disturbing comments made by people in different educational spaces about, well, if we can't measure it, we won't be doing it. There are concerns by politicians when large-scale groups like the Productivity Commission just a couple of days ago releasing reports saying we've been investing vast amounts of money in education and we're not getting the improvements we wanted either in student learning outcomes, in fact sometimes things are going worse, going backwards in the international level and the national level. We're hearing some really interesting statistics like in the NAPLAN, National uh, Literacy Testing uh, Area, students' performance for instance in spelling and language in the sort of compartmentalised way in which that's often thought of, those at best are remaining steady and perhaps even improving but the writing that students do when they're supposed to incorporate all of that together, scores are going down. And yet against that, train, uh, that trend, we're seeing some really strong professional learning com communities engaging in praxis-based uh, activity and generating impressive scholarly work, which is fantastic professional learning and rich resource in terms of knowledge generating about teaching of one sort or another. Okay, so with, with that, let's now move and look at some of the, a, a, particular, a particular story in a particular place, now that we've got that sense of a context. And I've called this the story of meaning making in a co-educational independent secondary school in regional Victoria. It features Natalie, who at that stage was a head of English in her, department, in her school, attending a special performance by a group of, I think was it five, Natalie, year eight students who were part of a specially withdrawn group who were in year eight but are struggling in terms of literacy. But instead of that group being drilled and skilled in a kind of really um, boring and challenging way, they were doing richly exciting, interesting, unusual, creative work and producing wonderful texts and importantly feeling really good about themselves through that kind of work. And Natalie uh, had produced this chapter, which includes some wonderful um, representations of the kinds of situations that she was encountering um, in this school, but in particular in relation to this, this first group. Now, she begins, interestingly, with a reference to a text by Ian Reid, which was one that she had first um, engaged with as a pre-service education student in 2003, when she was here at Monash University completing her PhD. So let's hand it over. Oh, and by the way, this is in relation to the text Whale Rider. Imagine, if you will, a room for making. This particular room is small and rather narrow. The couches, which usually form a cosy reading nook in the corner, have been rearranged in front of the fish tank to create the illusion of a small, intimate theatre. The windows have been covered with black cardboard to darken the room and a desk lamp has been strategically placed to shine as a spotlight on the small makeshift performance space. The faint sounds of giggles and whispered shushes descend from the office space connected to this small classroom by a short flight of stairs. Five students, the year eight English workshop class, silently and solemnly descend the stairs. They form a line, their faces outlined in the darkness by the makeshift spotlight. One student clicks her fingers three times by her side. Another student begins to speak solemnly and then another takes up the narrative and then another. Sometimes the lines are spoken in unison. The poem and its narrative begins to take shape. Soft strains of music coming from a laptop are entwined with their voices. Even though I am in a darkened room in a country town in regional Victoria, I can hear the sea. In my mind's eye, I can see a young girl riding on the back of a whale. Okay, I wish that we had time to look at the whole poem that these five students collaboratively have produced, but let me show you just a little bit of it with the music of Whale Rider in the background as they had when they performed it.
And remember these are students who were struggling in their normal English classes and this was uh, an effort to try and, they were kind of a, um, a, a group that was struggling and needed support, needed to build their confidence. Now we're going to have to stop it there and I now want to just show you a recreation of the conversation that took place after Natalie and the deputy, two deputy heads in the school, Natalie was head of English and some other senior leaders in the school who were there for the performance. They then had a conversation with the students about their uh, poem that they had just performed in front of them. And so Natalie has recreated that conversation as she had in the chapter that she wrote uh, and includes this. I'll ask you to read uh, the first bits and I'll just read the last bit uh, with you in a moment. The conversation is severely um, cut, I'm sorry, but just for time. And the last two students say, yeah, because this poem is kind of the story of our journey too, of us in English Workshop is the name of the group. So those are the lines we said together. Sometimes we fight or get annoyed with each other, but always find a way to come back together, like a family, another student said. And this is the kind of work that happens when people think differently about the way that they're teaching English, the way that they're teaching anything in a classroom when they're informed by the, what are the needs of these particular students rather than the needs of some um, decontextualised set of prescriptions which are saying that everybody at this stage should be doing this, this and this and if they haven't done it then damn it we need to go back to basics and make sure that we bore them rigid in order to be able to produce uh, the outcomes that we have decided they should be producing. So Natalie has written about this in this book which was co-edited by myself and my colleague Brenton Dakey and Wayne Sawyer in, in Sydney called Language and Creativity in Contemporary English Classrooms. And Natalie had been writing for a while before that in a number of these uh, uh, praxis-based pieces and narrative-based pieces. Um, here's just the, the first of a, a significant chapter in, and, and these books are presenting work of teacher educators and experienced researchers alongside the likes of Natalie who are teachers in classrooms producing this really impressive scholarly work. Um, it's fantastic to be able to be involved in projects like that and, and Natalie is one example of many. But I put it to you that this is the kind of projects that in professional learning communities that are speaking back powerfully to standards-based reforms and addressing the particular needs of particular kids in the progress, in the process. Okay, so how have we got to the stage where I'm speaking so um, emotively, you might say, passionately, you might say, um, about the kind of policy environment that we found ourselves in 2016? One way to answer that question is to look at the progress in the last, 2000, uh, last eight years, if progress is the right word, of the kind of standardisation of educational practices and curriculum and structures throughout Australia, um, mirroring what's happening in other parts of the world, I should say. So, okay, we've got these neoliberal agendas driving <coughs> standardisation, that the, the assumption being the more that we can do this in a standardised way, the more efficient it can be and therefore the better will be the outcomes for students and their, and their learning outcomes. And therefore standards will be increased, standards will be improved, um, everyone will benefit and the world will be a perfect place in just a few years' time if we give it a bit of time. Okay, so what's actually happened? Well, it was 2008, it seems an eternity ago, but it was only actually eight years ago that the national uh, the, the testing regime for literacy and numeracy was introduced in, in Australia. First of all, grade three, five and seven, extended to grade nine, and wait for it, soon to be uh, extended to grade one. Then followed up by school, my school website, the standardised version of the Australian curriculum, which is partially complete, mm, complete in many ways. The national standards for teachers were introduced in 2012. Professional standards for teachers and, uh, sorry, uh, the, the national standards for accreditation of um, initial teacher education institutions like us. Uh, generic professional standards for teachers, principals, uh, charters for teachers' professional learning, so they could be standardised. 
um, accountability regimes structured so that the research that's being done is going to address the kind of produce the kind of evidence that standards-based reforms wants to see. So we're already in 2015 hearing, uh, reading research which has been produced by Aitzel saying this is the kind of research that initial teacher education institutions need to be producing in order to be able to get the evidence that we can actually show that they're doing what they should be doing or not. And then we've had the, um, the so distressingly um, uh, disappointing um, outcome of all of our efforts to speak back to the, the notion of standardised personal literacy and numeracy tests for all teacher education um, students. We've lost that one. We're now having standardised literacy testing for um, all edu teacher education students from this year onwards. And it occurs to me, as it occurs to actually Natalie and I wrote about this in 2006, there's a certain kind of Thomas Gradgrind mentality behind all of this. The kind of, the kind of mentality that it can say uh, this kind of a statement about um, facts in Charles Dickens' comedic, but darkly comedic novel, Hard Times, written in the mid-19th century, but presenting a really powerful, meaningful critique on the kind of practices that we're engaged in in 2016. We could substitute the word facts with evidence. And the problem is not with facts or with evidence, it's the fact that we're not prepared to look at and investigate and inquire into what we understand facts or evidence to mean. That's the difficulty. Okay, but within the last month, uh, a senior Monash lecturer, not in the education faculty I should say, was heard to say we need to teach in ways that have measurable outcomes. I found that a little disturbing principal in a school that I mentioned earlier. If we can't measure it, we won't be doing it. Could you measure the kind of stuff that those year eight students were presenting in that kind of work using the kind of evidence that a standards-based reform, um, uh, reform re system requires? Well, it's really difficult. And then the Productivity Commission coming out just this week and saying that we needed to expand the national data collection and that grade one national testing would be starting soon, despite what I've told you about national testing sh shown to be problematic at this stage. And at the same time, we need to re reduce and rationalise data collection costs. Guess what? Narrative-based research is not very cost-effective according to the kind of standards-based reforms discourses that are operating at the moment. And this is not news. None of this has taken us by surprise. There were the, the, most the most esteemed, highly esteemed people, researchers, educators in the world were saying more than 10 years ago, we need to widen the range of evidence if we're going to be involved in rich, meaningful educational practice. Yes, evidence important, is important. Accountability is really important. But let's not narrow it down to something which we starts to threaten the, what, the understandings and the ethical practice that we understand e education being about. So what happened? Well, we got more and more high stakes standardised literacy testing for kids in schools and now in teacher education. And at the very best one can say about standardised testing of this, of, and I'm going to talk about literacy because that's what I know more about, it can provide some kind of a structure and a focus where it's not otherwise evident. And one needs to say, OK, testing in itself is not kind of the devil, but the balance and how it fits into the larger key scheme of things is important. It can provide a set of data. It's cheaply um, produced data. And it might be used to plan for teaching and learning and to evaluate past teaching. Mind you, the concern about it being cheap and being able to uh, be produced early enough that it can have an influence on students learning in schools has meant that we're now going towards NAPLAN tests and the literacy part of NAPLAN tests being all online. So students answers to multiple choice questions and their extended writing will all now be marked by computers despite the national associations of English teachers in secondary schools and primary educators saying this is really, really disturbing. But it's going ahead. There's an awful th the problem with standardised testing of literacy and so forth is that it can test some things, but it actually can test only a very little. Here's a beginning list of the things that it can't assess. Remember how much money is involved in the kind of national testing regime of literacy, but it can't assess 
digital multimodal literacy, critical literacy, creativity, collaboration, ethical practice, persistence uh, in terms of teacher education, research skills and application of research knowledge, identity work which is closely associated with literacy. It can't touch any of that. And no one makes a claim that it can. But of course what happens is that more and more teachers teach to the test or in, in places where their performance is going to be judged by this, they use the standardised test as part of their key performance indicators. And it narrows the range of teaching strategies, and narrows the range of knowledge and skills do, deemed important for learning, strong disincentive for experimenting because what if it goes wrong? And it discourages creativity, collaboration, critical thinking. There's plenty of research being produced across the world by people who have a strong investment about inquiring into the ethical use of these kind of works, but it's not actually heard. Now, that's a pretty bleak picture that I'm presenting here. And if it were all as bleak as that, then we may as well all just go home now. <laughs> Thankfully, it's not quite as all as bleak as that. And in fact, the kind of research that I'm talking about, the kind of projects that I want to spend some time thinking about and reflecting on now, are the kind of projects that are a huge, um, valuable and uh, set of practices and projects that give, give hope and optimism about, about a future that has the potential to speak back to standards-based reforms in really powerful and meaningful ways. Powerful and meaningful ways that impact on teachers' work, on teacher educators' work, on schooling as we understand it, that will help students in the long run. The wonderful thing about the kind of work that I'm talking about here is that as teachers like Natalie and others that we'll hear about in a moment, including pre-service teachers, engage in this kind of work, they are producing texts, they are producing resources, they are producing evidence and facts which speaks to the says, okay, so where's the value in this? There's actually really strong, powerful, persuasive, compelling value that we see in these kinds of stories. But we need to keep continually speaking back to the kind of other discourses and other forces operating. So this is the kind of work I suppose uh, the, it's customary for people presenting these kind of lectures to be able to present, you know, if this is your view of the world, what are you doing about it? So pardon me for this uh, being a slightly sort of defensive, well this is the things I'm trying. Uh, I should say I, um, myself and many of the colleagues that I have here, um, Scott Bulfin's here, um, Fleur Diamond's here, um, uh, a whole range of uh, other people that I'm working with in the education faculty and, and a number of students, um, graduate research students and teachers in schools as well. Okay, so first of all, our English teachers are using narrative in critical autobiographies and English methods. They're doing some really powerful work to investigate knowledge and produce knowledge, reflect on their practice and produce texts which are really powerful resources for other people to help them reflect on their practices. And they're being produced in journals and scholarly uh, collections which have legitimacy as knowledge. We've been, uh, Scott Buffin and I have been really uh, fortunate to be able to work with two co-teaching um, uh, fellows, I suppose, or co-teachers in the form of Fleur, uh, Fleur Diamond and uh, Natalie Bellis. Um, that's been a really powerful experience for all of us in that time and we have been producing texts which show this is the kind of knowledge that we're doing, this is the kind of experience that it's all about. Um, some of the work that I've done in terms of uh, the South African International Practicum uh, as part of a community looking at international professional experience who are all interested in narrative um, is, a, is a really um, an important part of my work, although I won't be talking about it so much tonight. Um, the generation and leading of a project called Stella 2.0 which um, came after a, another project about 14 years ago, the, the original Stella project from around the turn of the century where pre-service and professional English teachers and teacher educators come together to create, to talk and to write narrative-based writing as part of their membership of this professional learning community with the support of professional associations. And the range of scholarly collaborations with pre-service teachers, early career teachers and more experienced teachers that are part of the work that I and Scott Bulfin and others are, are doing. Um, which we feel is a really important part of this work. Okay, now that's just flashed rather quickly. So let me just say, is, is this all about um, 
if you tell a story, you solve the problems of the world? Well, no. I think if we're going to claim legitimacy, we're going to claim a sort of uh, epistemological warrant for this kind of work being powerful, we need, it needs to be carefully theorised. And so, let me just give you some of the insights into kind of the theoretical resources that we're working with in these kind of spaces. Those people who know me well and all of our teacher education students learn fairly quickly that Mikhail Bakhtin keeps popping up from time to time in various phases. Um, this was a, a, a key quote for me in my PhD work and has remained central to most of my understandings of educational work and research. Bakhtin says, truth is not to be found inside the head of an individual person. It's born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of dialogic interaction. And that has been a powerful principle, a powerful uh, theoretical underpinning of all of the kind of work that we're engaged in. There are two other sets of discourses that I might just mention briefly. Bakhtin's notion of, uh, Bakhtin and various other Bakhtinian scholars talk about monologic authoritarian discourses uh, in tension with dialogic authoritative discourses. Sorry about the kind of the, the dense language, but bear with me for a moment. So the notion of monologic discourses or authoritarian discourses where someone speaks and you know that you're not invited to ask questions or speak back to it. The truth is there as Greg Grind would say it, and there's no questioning, you don't have the right or the space or the time to be able to question it or speak or, 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 ask, or ask any kind of inquiry about it. It demands our unconditional allegiance. There's a whole lot of policy that works in just that way, uh, even though Bakhtin was writing this m many, many years before what we're understanding as standards-based reforms coming. And yet we're not talking about dialogue as a kind of wishy-washy, we all talk together, things will solve themselves. Bakhtin and Bakhtinian scholars talk about authoritative discourses which invite dialogue, which invite questions. They might be quite firmly um, assertive and they might quite be robust in the way that they present arguments, but they are always inviting, requiring, in fact urging people to ask questions. In a sense they might be demanding our attention but it's always to inspire further dialogue, critical um, engagement and growth. Okay, so in terms of narrative and that role in, in, in the kind of work that we're doing, I, I mentioned in my abstract uh, Roland Barthes' notion of the, num the narratives of the world are numberless. If they are as ubiquitous as they are, one would think it might be the important part of the kind of work of educators and researchers to acknowledge that and find ways to incorporate that into the kinds of knowledge production and um, research into educational experiences we're engaged in. Um, a researcher who's not known so much outside of education processes is a guy called Harold Rosen from England who was, who was um, an inspiration to many of us working in this, um, in this field. His notion of a vision of praxis that could speak back to what he called in three decades ago, ruled govern settings that are imposed on students and teachers is incredibly um, compelling in 2016. And he said specifically, narrative has a really important role to play in educational research and knowledge creation. Not instead of, but in addition to the traditional forms of inquiry. In terms of the other names of, of uh, theorists who worked in this area, these are the kinds of people that we've been particularly interested in, engaged with and, and inspired by. And one other person that Scott and I have been working with most recently, one of the person's work is uh, this uh, Italian philosopher Adriana Cavarero, who theorised this notion of what and who narratives. Just, just briefly I want to mention this and then we'll move on. She characterised the, the what narratives of the world as the, no, the narratives which were drawing on de generic dimensions of practice. The kinds of practices that can be prescribed and described away from and, and without knowing any of the contexts of what's happening in particular situations. And she called it definitory language. Uh, language is about defining and, and prescribing. And sh we would argue that that's using the kind of monologic authoritarian discourse. It's not to say that something is either that or the other, but it's a pretty interesting characteristic of a whole lot of what we might understand as what narratives or what discourse. The who narratives, interestingly, Cavarero says, these are the ones that focus on the particular, the culturally, institutionally mediated dimensions of teaching that we heard so powerfully in Nat Natalie's um, narrative. Of course, it's influenced by history, biography, experience, 
membership of different discourse communities and it pays respect to those different discourse communities. These are the kinds of stories that can capture what uh, Cavarero talks about, the unrepeatable uniqueness of individual story, whether it be individual research or an individual group or an individual school, but the sense in which it's deeply unrepeatable and unique. And it is, we would argue, um, enhanced by and um, facilitated by dialogic discourses. And it's not that, that, that narratives are either one or the other. In fact, the most interesting narratives are the ones which draw on these together and play them off against each other. One does not have the kind of luxury of saying, I just want to be a who narrative, thank you very much, because the rest of our lives are actually driven and imposed upon by a whole lot of what narratives. And some things, of course, fall in the middle spaces. Okay, so now we've just got a little bit of time to look at some of the narrative-based praxis projects within professional learning communities um, that I've been engaged in and, and privileged to work with a whole range of teachers, uh, pre-service teachers, um, and people working on the, on the periphery of, of schools. The first one that I want to draw attention to is the work that's happening in, in Monash English Methods. Now this is not the time to explain what a particular assignment is all about, except to provide just a little bit of the, um, the context. So one of the things students in their first semester in English methods, that's people who are about to, they're, they're in their last year before um, graduating as teachers ready to teach in schools, they can do a critical autobiography where they identify and inquire into their beliefs and values about English teaching. And they're encouraged to look at a couple of key moments in their experiences as English students, either at school or at university or both. The pieces are both critical and creative. They're using analytical strategies and narrative strategies, which for many is, oh, hang on, why can't you make up your mind? But in fact, it's a really a, 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 a proliferating body of work in this area that's understanding the value of um, interweaving these things together. As I said, we've been able to produce many of these pieces of work, sometimes whole collections of, of students' work in the past, and our current students get the chance to read this and be hopefully interested in, maybe even inspired, to produce work like this. Okay, so now I want to refer to one piece of work that was produced fairly recently. Um, this is actually a piece produced by Sarah, who's with us, and I've actually invited Sarah to read from the latter part of it, but this is a, this is a scholarly piece of work. Let me emphasise that first of all. Her response to the invitation to inquire into some of her English learning was to reflect on some of her English learning in a particular context in American um, institutions uh, and a few years ago working with some pretty incredible but very, very different educators. And it's all constructed as a play. So you can see all of the, all of the, the structures, the, the, um, the signals which suggest this is a play. There's production notes, there's a scene, there's uh, di stage directions and lighting directions. Interestingly, in the production notes, we hear the play is designed to assist the narrator as she finds her identity as an English teacher. Sarah's taken the option to write in the third person, at least for some of the time, about her own experiences in order to be able to get some critical distance, perhaps. And she's, she begins to, by taking the reader into some of these different spaces where she's been um, influenced by quite, quite different teachers. Now, I want to uh, invite Sarah to... Uh, to read from some of this passage, if, fr from the very top. Is that okay, Sarah? Narrator appears stage right, spotlight up. Narrator. This was one of the last classes I took before graduating from university. Judith Butler helped to facilitate the class. She shared her ideas, she mediated, but she never lectured. She created an atmosphere of interest, a non-judgmental space for open dialogue, a free-flowing hour of discussion and idea formation. We spoke about personal experiences in this classroom. We worked through cultural, social, and historical narratives that dealt with the politics of loss and mourning at a collective level. We examined non-fictional narratives that were emotional and controversial. These voices were palpable and opened the greater world to me. I played in this space. I had a voice here, a place for creative expression. Lights down, end scene. 
These two classroom settings, both formative for our narrator, represent teaching modes that approach writing and literacy using discrepant pedagogy. The traditional lecture format exemplified by Schuster emphasizes meaning making from classic texts but minimizes dynamic involvement by the learners and as such does not seek to creatively develop their individual voices. Okay, now we, we haven't got time to read all of it. So thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, you, you can see the way that Sarah's playing around with all kinds of conventions and understandings of communication and, and inquiry into the kind of experiences that she shared. You'll see that in this narrative piece there are references, scholarly references in the way that people when they first imagine this kind of piece they can't understand how that could actually work. But it's, you know, it was, uh, as, uh, as you I think getting a strong impression, really impressive, really interesting work for those of us who haven't written it to be able to engage with, for our, our students later on to be able to share, for others outside of our course to be able to share. Um, Sarah's planning to publish this um, sometime soon, we hope. Okay, now these are the kinds of reflections that students are in the course are writing about the kind of writing that they're doing in this kind of pseudo-praxis-based, narrative-based writing space in the professional learning community that is our English methods class. Let me just invite you to read either one or the other. The first one is something that Scott and I have published in a, in a, 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 um, a journal article in Cambridge Journal of Education and the one, next one is from a piece that's about to be published. Nice little intertextual reference to Natalie Bellis there too. That's very nice. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to move on. Sorry if I have rushed you a little bit there. Now, in terms of the learning, we can talk about learning happening in and from this kind of writing. There's, you can see how these different notions of what narratives and who narratives are uh, potentially able to uh, weave in against, uh, in amongst each other. There are, these are very situated, reflexive responses to situations that students have found themselves in that they're still making sense of in the context of a teacher education course. There are strong use of dialogic intertextual references that students making meaning as they engage with and bounce off other texts and other ideas. Certainly destabilising the notion of things being either just a pure what or a pure who narrative in the way that most of our teaching lives and educating lives are about. Certainly in this kind of work the student who's doing this is this is really powerful identity work. It helps to develop their sense of who they are as that process of who they are is changing. And it brings the who and the what into very palpable and um, perceptible tension as all of our work as educators necessarily is. Okay, so now I've got time just to the, the last part of the project of the presentation to talk about one other project and to hear from one of our other writers. This is the Stella 2.0 project, which I don't have time to talk about its precursor, the Stella project, but um, it was an inspiration in terms of the first um, bringing together of teachers from across the country to write and talk about their practices, to generate narratives about their practices, and from those narratives to produce a set of standards about accomplished English teaching, as it was then. Way before standards were a twinkle in the eye of bureaucrats of today. Um, and yet the standards that were produced in those sort of powerful, really um, um, exciting times are perceived as something which is not easily measurable and so easily discardable in terms of the conversations about um, accountability and teachers' work. So the Stella project is taking place and there's been two iterations of it so far and we're hoping it will be an ongoing thing. This is a policy landscape dominated by standards-based reforms. The, the project is comprised of a series of three themed workshops and many of you who've been in this uh, room have actually been part of those workshops. Uh, each workshop has involves readings, conversations, writing, reflection, usually about 50 minutes of writing silently in a room. Uh, it involves pre-service teachers, graduate teachers, experienced teachers, retired teachers, teacher educators, all in the same room, learning with and from each other in a fairly distinctive environment for professional learning. 
and a, an associated uh, web space which has a whole range of resources and um, importantly the work that's um, that some of the writing that's produced in these workshops and the important thing to know is that of course we're not producing something which is completely distinctive and although there are some things which are qu quite different from others but this is the kind of work that's happening across the world and I just mentioned some of those projects including um, one of my PhD projects, one of Scott and my PhD projects, um, Nikki Aharonian in Israel. So here we have just an example of one of those professional learning communities, writing communities coming together to talk and write and we frame this as speaking and writing back to standards-based reforms. Inspired in some ways by Mawson's notion that one needs a certain kind of dialogic ac activity in order to favour the unfinalizable, the readiness for something new and original. And of course, the unfinalizable is the, actually the anathema to standards-based reforms. Because we, knew we need to be able to prescribe in advance what we will do, how we will do it, and what the outcomes will be. Otherwise, it's probably not valuable. And yet the one thing that, this, this, that uh, characterises the kind of writing that the teachers are talking about through this is this kind of work. And some people uh, are, are are in this photo actually represented. Here we have Helen right down here. And I would like to invite her Helen to read some of her writing that she produced in a workshop just a couple of months ago. I witnessed a vast change in the teaching and learning landscape. Language in politics, the media, teaching, PDs and classrooms rapidly evolved into talk of education for jobs, international rankings, failing schools, linear progression points, teacher quality and education as a saleable commodity. Australia's world ranking in international testing was held as the indicator of the success of our education system. Teachers seem to be held directly and solely responsible for our failing system. The teaching and learning space took on yet another persona. Numbers and scores again became highly important in defining student learning. The quality of schools and teachers was measured according to scores and rated against one another. Direct relationships were sought between student and school scores and individual teacher quality. Every feature of learning was required to be numeralised. As one principal told me, if we can't measure it, we don't do it. More and more time was devoted to NAPLAN preparation with mock testing implemented and the selected writing genre, the teaching focus. Student and teacher anxiety around NAPLAN implementation and results appeared to rise year by year. Thanks, Helen. And in fact, this is a small part of, uh, it was incredibly uh, long and involved, really rich text where somebody uh, t at the, the end of their teaching career was looking back as Helen was over the kind of stages of, of English teaching as she remembered them and to highlight these sort of changes which um, in retrospect uh, seem so clear but as we're, as we're living them they tend not to be so clear. Um, interestingly ended up with a significant note of optimism as she talked about the kind of work that she is inspired by as she is part of these learning communities where she hears about the great work that others in the community, including, including her daughter, if you don't mind me saying that, who's an English teacher, uh, who are doing some really inspirational work, who are not determined and not confined and constrained by the kind of um, standards-based reforms that, um, and the pressures that we've been talking about. There's some other kind of writing which is done. And I want to finish with this rather kind of subversive, witty, clever, out there, left field stuff. This is a piece of work submitted and put online anonymously by uh, a person who was, if not just at the end of her teacher education, then was possibly still in the middle. I'll leave you to read it. One of our uh, theorists who we so, are so powerful uh, in the work that we're doing in this space um, is Mikhail Bakhtin. And Bakhtin, I don't know whether you know his work, um, uh, is, is interested in notions of the carnival, 
which opens up a space where the unfinalizing, unfinalizable, the unexpected, the new, the different can be opened up. If you open up this space, call it creative, call it open-ended, uh, where the kind of writing where people are allowed to explore. One might say the kind of work that was possible in, in the English workshop group that, um, that Natalie was privileged to be able to see in that year eight group. You might talk about as the kind of work that people like Sarah are doing in a pre-service education space where there's quite an open-ended task to be able to with, with respond to. And the kind of professional learning communities where work like this is, is produced. Um, not meaning to suggest that any of these things, narrative is not a panacea, it's not a magic pill, but it is a really powerful way that groups of teachers are showing when they come together and have that space. Groups of pre-service teachers are showing where they have that space and this encouragement that they can actually explore some of those un un unexplored parts, uh, parts that are not clearly defined and can't be clearly defined and opening up the possibility for growth and development and knowledge making that is not prescribed by standards and the various um, performance standards that are prescribed for us. But I, also, but I want to finish by, with another posting as part of the Stella program, which was, there's always more to a story. And it goes like this, I feel like most stories of practice and the negotiations that occur every day in every school, the system, the institution, colleagues, students initially, are far more complex than simple tales of triumph over a reductive system. I firmly believe that narrative is the best way to bring those complexities to light, but even then I feel dissatisfied with my own attempts. So much gets left out of every telling, even narrative telling. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think I might take this opportunity uh, on your behalf, uh, if we could show Graham our appreciation for an excellent lecture. <laughs>